So good morning. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Luke. We're excited because we are on the, the, the final track to finish the book of Luke before the new year. I'm super excited about that because that means we get to pick something new to start uh, January off with, which I haven't done yet, but I will let you guys know as soon as I do. Today we're in Luke chapter 22, and we're going to start in verse 54. We don't have our slide guys, so... If you want to follow along, you can. If not, that's okay. You don't have to. You can just listen to me. Uh, we're going to read through this. And the reason we're doing it this way is because I really, I, I want to keep the momentum of the story going. Because I, I you know, when we break up, you know, a, a whole book of the Bible, sometimes we, we forget where we're at in the actual story of the progression of the gospel. And now that we're at the end, we're, you know, today we're going to talk about the crucifixion. I thought it would be cool just to keep things moving. So I hope that's all right with you guys. There's a couple uh, caveats that I want to add here that... Um, that, that might be helpful if you're familiar with uh, the Gospels. Just so you know, there's four Gospel uh, uh, books in the Bible. These are the story of Jesus' life, uh, you know, death, resurrection. Uh, three of them are called the Synoptic Gospels. They're very similar. They're um, really kind of just more linear of like the history of Jesus. That's uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so uh, the, the stories that play out in the Gospels, there's some of them will include uh, an element that another one didn't. And so it's great to go through and read them all and get a better, like more complete picture of what really happened to Jesus. But one, if, if you're familiar, I just want to add this, this, this in. And in two of the gospels, and this is Matthew, Mark, there's something that Jesus says on the cross that um, is pretty profound. And, and as he's on the cross, he says, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Anybody familiar with that or ever heard about that verse? Okay, that's a great verse. It's, it's recorded in Matthew. It's recorded in Mark. It's not recorded in Luke. And there's something else that's recorded in Luke that's not recorded in Matthew and Mark. And I want to focus on what's in Luke. Not, and don't hear what I'm not saying. I believe Jesus said both these things so I'm, I'm not saying that he didn't say it because it's not in Luke. It's in Matthew. It's in Mark. He, he definitely said, uh, you know, Father, Father, why have you not forsaken me? I think that that in itself, what Jesus says there on the cross could be a sermon of its, its, its own. But what I want to focus on today, we're going to get there, is something profound that Jesus says as he's, he's on the cross. And he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And so when we get to that part, that's what we're going to dive in on today. I think that's an, an incredibly profound statement for somebody to make um, as they're being murdered <laughs> by, um, you know, a, a bunch of people that, that hate you. So just wanted to add that so that afterwards... You know, I don't get rushed with a bunch of questions. Why didn't you cover that? We're just going to stick to Luke today, and uh, we'll probably come back to that piece um, in another sermon. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's pray, and then let's jump in. I'm excited. So Father God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you. Um, God, we just, I mean, geez, like, thank you for, for the sacrifice you made for us to have life. Lord, it's pretty, pretty amazing that you loved us that much, that you were willing to go all the way for us. And um, God, I just, uh, God, I just ask this morning as we read um, through your story, Lord, that God, that you inspire us to, to want to lay down our life in the, in the same way that you did. Not, not that we have to die, but God, that, that we'd be willing to go all the way for people and all the way for you. And, and so, Father... Um, God, we, we thank you for the great example in Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to read through this stuff, and I think it's going to be really good. So last week, we talked about the, um, the Last Supper, and we talked about the betrayal, right? Judas betrays Jesus. Um, we talked about, you know, we really focused in on in the garden. Jesus is, is you know, he's... Um, praying and he's, he's, he's sweating blood and he's telling the disciples, don't fall asleep so you don't enter into temptation. And we, we talked about, about that, that, you know, when we, when we feel stressed and when we feel, um, you know, 
that things are all going wrong, we should really be aware of that and press into the Lord because it's in those moments that we are more susceptible to uh, temptation. At least that's been my experience. And I, I think that's what Jesus was talking about. And one of the things that, that we also focused on was like the, the last supper wasn't, it, it was a heavy night. It was heavy. There was betrayal. There was arguments about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. There's rebukes from Jesus. You know, there's all this stuff going on. And then it ends with Jesus being arrested. And that's where we're going to pick up is Jesus has been arrested. And remember that Jesus even told Peter, I mean, this is a heavy time. Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And of course, Peter is like, that'll never happen. Why would I do that? That's a stupid idea, Jesus. Jesus, you say a lot of good things, but every once in a while, you're way out there. I would never do that. <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> and so we're going we're gonna to pick up there. Jesus has just been uh, arrested. It says, then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you are also one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. And about an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered the word that the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Heavy stuff, right? It goes on, the men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy who hit you. And they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. And Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you the Son of God? And he replied, you say that I am. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from your own lips. And so this statement here, this reply from Jesus, you say that I am, this is, a, um, this is a, like a saying. You know how we have sayings that kind of like imply certain things? What he's saying there is he is saying like, he's not denying it at this point. Saying, well, you say that I am and, and kind of leaving it at that. They, they're doing this in the morning, but... They also did this in the night. And it's important because when you read through the different gospel accounts, you're going to get a clearer picture of, of how these things have to play out. Um, a, a couple of things to remember is the, the Jewish authority here, they don't really have authority when it comes to like the death penalty or something like that. This would have to be taken up by the Romans. But the Romans don't really care much about a guy who says he's the Messiah. All right. So... This is, you know, this is going to play out here in a minute. But another thing I just wanted to share is that there is an extreme rush on what's happening here. So they've already met in the night, and, and you can get this in the other Gospels. They met, and they have all the, the leaders are all together. So they are all in one accord of wanting this to go down a certain way. But it is illegal to pass judgment on somebody in the nighttime. So they have to have this council in the morning. So usually, if this was any other trial, it would probably wait till day. They would, they would you know, have this trial, decide if he was guilty. They would wait to the next day and then pass judgment. But these things are happening very fast. Okay, so... When, you, when we, we get here to when Jesus actually dies, it's around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's about that time. Um, this stuff is moving very fast, and he's going to bounce around. If you looked at a map of where Jesus traveled, um, as he, he's going to go to this guy, Pilate, and we're going to talk about that, then he's going to go to this guy, Herod, and then he's going to come back to Pilate, and then he's going to go to this place called the Skull, or Golgotha, or Calvary, and he's going he's gonna to die or be crucified. These places are actually very close to each other. 
So it's not like, you know, Jesus taking a trip to Portland and going and talking to somebody there and then being sent to, you know, the governor in Salem and then back to Bend or something like that. These things are, are being rushed and, and the, the people that they're encountering are all very close as, as we're going to find out. Is that, I don't know if that's helpful. It helped me to kind of understand like what is happening here and to remember to bring in the human element that we're not just reading a story, but we're reading history. So we're not reading, you know, cat in the hat, okay? We're reading real people that, that this really happened. And historically, the historians will agree that Jesus was a real man that really was crucified in this way. What they'll disagree on is what happened to him later, which we're going to talk about next week, um, whether or not he was resurrected or somebody stole his body. But this is a real historical account. Okay, so things are going really fast. They, they hold another meeting in the morning to make it look like this is all happening the way it's supposed to. That's probably the only reason that they would meet again in the morning is try to give people the idea that this trial that's happening is actually on the books when it's really not, right? There's a lot of shady stuff going on. So we're going to go back and now we're in uh, chapter 23, uh, verse 1. It says, and the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. Now, Pilate's the guy who's in charge of this region. He's a Roman uh, leader. He's the guy that they need to convince that Jesus is guilty. Now, remember, Pilate probably doesn't care about what they care about. So you're going to, you know, uh, Romans were not Christians, right, for the most part. There might have been, you know, some that converted later on. And, but these guys are not really interested in this whole thing like, hey, he says he's God. Like, to Pilate, what does that mean? <laughs> Pilate's like, okay, well, all right, I, I, you know, that's a hard one. So they have to sell this to, to the Romans somehow. They can't just kill somebody. And it says, then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, we found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payments of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, are you king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. So notice real, real fast how they pose this to Pilate. Now, if you guys have been following along in Luke, you know well that Jesus never opposed paying taxes to Caesar. In fact, when they asked him about paying taxes, he said, hey, whose face is on the denarius or the coin? They said Caesar. Well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, right? And give to God what is God. So they're already lying about Jesus. And then they tack in this little piece at the end that, you know, he, he also says he's the Messiah. Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. Also, if you guys have been following along, have, have you guys noticed Jesus stirring people up, causing trouble? I don't think so. <laughs> On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at the time. Okay, so he's sending him to Herod, who is um, a Jewish ruler. So he's going to try to, you know, hey, we'll send it to one of your guys, see if this guy will handle it. And he happens to be in Jerusalem at the time. So this is important. This is why this is all happening really quickly. It's not Jesus going, you know, a, a, across the state. He's going to basically just, a, just across the way. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently. How do you say that word? Vehemently. It's a big one. Accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. 
Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. And the idea there is that hopefully a beating will satisfy these guys. And this was pretty customary. Um, this was like, even if you were accused of something and you didn't do something, sometimes you would you'd get your butt kicked a little bit just in case you ever thought about maybe doing it again. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> this isn't like a, an unknown, um, you know, thing here where it's just like, why are they going to give him a beat down? I mean, he's saying he's innocent. This is just kind of a deterrent, like just in case, maybe you're guilty. Um, don't do it again because it'll get a lot worse. It says, but the whole crowd shouted, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. So they want this guy to be released that's in jail right now because it's, it's customary on the Passover to release a prisoner who actually did the thing that they're accusing Jesus of doing and murder. So he's actually worse. And uh, their reply, wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then I will release him. But the loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for and surrendered Jesus to their will. So it's an interesting picture of Pilate, you know, and Pilate really tried to get, I mean, I would say he, he could have been a better leader in the sense of, you know, just not giving in to shouts and stuff like that. And that's probably a good lesson for anybody who aspires to be a leader just because there's loud voices around you wanting you to do something doesn't mean you have to, all right? But it is interesting to see Pilate's response here is actually pretty level-headed until things got too crazy. Um, he really advocated for Jesus' release. So when you look at the crucifixion of Christ and you think about that, it's, I wouldn't say it's really fair to put it on the Romans. It really is the, the Jewish people that are, are pushing for this. And more specifically, I wouldn't just say the Jewish people. There's a lot of people who love Jesus but these religious leaders, these Pharisees. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and they put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Now, it would be customary for Jesus to carry uh, a, a cross, but before somebody gets crucified, they scourge them, they beat them, and they whip them, and people are actually known to die during this period. So Jesus to this point, has been brutally abused. And he's not even able to, it doesn't sound like he's even able to carry his own cross. They actually have to get somebody to help him. If any of you guys seen Passion of the Christ, probably give you a pretty good picture of um, what, what this could look like. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children, for the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women in the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For if the people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And just a reminder, if anybody is unaware of uh, you know, what crucifixion is, uh, it was a pretty common um, you know, form of capital punishment back then. And it was meant to be uh, a slow and painful death. So it's, it's not, you know, uh, the, you know, the electric chair, or, you know, something is supposed to be fast. This is meant 
to be humiliating, it's meant to be painful, it's meant to be slow, and uh, they would literally, you know, drive, um, you know, nails through your, your hands and your, your ankles, and they would nail you to this, this, these boards, and sometimes they'd be shaped like an X, sometimes they'd be shaped like a Y, um, in this case, shaped like a cross, you know, whatever they could create to kind of make this, this happen. So it's really an awful way to go. It says, the people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine, vinegar, and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah, save yourself in us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. This this piece right here is pretty amazing. for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, one of the reasons is like, how, how amazing is that, that a criminal that is next to him knows that he's innocent? How does he know that? You know, it, it's, it, you know, you, I, I couldn't tell you for sure, but maybe he knows who Jesus is, you know, but it's interesting that even a condemned person to die recognizes the innocence of Christ, but yet here's these religious leaders that are like, crucify him, crucify him. It's pretty, pretty heavy stuff. But it's also, how incredible is it that it's that easy to turn to Christ? And, and I love what he said. He just says, remember me. And I love this because it's, it's this really personal connection to Christ that he wants. He wants to be remembered by Jesus. It's not just save me. There's this idea of knowing. And there's scripture that, you know, Jesus himself talked about. He said, people will come to me and say, hey, didn't I do this and that? And he's like, depart from me because I didn't know, we never knew each other. And so I love that this, this criminal on the cross recognizes like there's something about knowing Christ that is important. And he wants to be known by Jesus. And that knowing, what does it lead to? He says, today we will be in paradise. I love that. It really kind of simplifies, like, what does it mean to give my life to Jesus? You know, to to desire to be known by God and to know him. It's just, it's pretty amazing. I love it. So it goes on. It was about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. So this is happening all pretty fast. Remember, a lot of this happened in the morning. It's noon. And now the land has gone dark. And there's some, I would encourage all of you to read through the other accounts of the crucifixion um, because there is some pretty incredible things that happened during this period of time. Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun stopped shining. And, and also, just so you guys know, this is not an eclipse. I, I did a little research on this. Somebody will say this is an eclipse, but where the moon is at on Passover I, this is what I read, maybe, I, and I submit I could be wrong, but this is what I read, is that it is literally impossible for a, a solar eclipse to happen because of where the moon would have been at, at Passover. We know it's Passover. So this is darkness. This isn't like some natural phenomenon for what I believe and what I've read. Um, the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. So, This is, I mean, man, this is heavy stuff. Heavy stuff. So a couple of of things that that happen here. So there's this darkness that that shows up, and there's this tearing of um, this curtain that would separate people from the Holy of Holies that was in the temple. And when Jesus is, is crucified, there's this tearing. 
in this removing of this veil that, that was to keep us from this, the Holy of Holies, which is pretty amazing. That Jesus literally, like his paying the price, has given us access to the Holy of Holies all the time. It's no longer this place that, we, that only a priest can go. But actually, we're all priests now, right? So we all have access to this part of God, which is incredible. And then there's this dying of Jesus, and there's this shaking. And it even says in, in some of the, uh, the stories that there was, the, the dead were brought back to life. That there was people saw dead relatives and dead friends walking around after this happened. So there was like this intense effect at this time. And so it makes sense when you start to read this and like think about it, why the centurion is all of a sudden like he is really the Messiah. Like there's this knowing at this point, like, oops, we, uh, we messed up. Oops. <laughs> Never saw that happen. And, and there's just this, this beating, like they know that wrong has been done. And people are not walking away from this feeling good. People, I mean, I don't know where the Pharisees are. I would doubt that they were even watching. I don't even know, you know. But it's hard to imagine that anybody walked away from what just happened feeling good about what they saw. It's, it's pretty heartbreaking. But we know that Jesus, is that me? It's me. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> but we, we'll talk about the resurrection last week, so we know this story has a, a happy ending. But what heaviness it, there must have been to have been there. And uh, I, I read something interesting because in Acts, it, it, when we, you get to the book of Acts and you read about the early church, there's some pretty amazing things happening. And one of the amazing things that happens is that people are being saved by the thousands. Like people are giving their life to Jesus. In fact, they're baptizing them. It's like, it must have been like a full-time job just for, for all these people that are coming to Christ. And I read from somebody, I never really connected this dot, but I had read some, somebody wrote, they said, it, part of that could be these people that witness this that are leaving, beating their chests. Yeah. That when Jesus is resurrected and it's game back on, that people are like, they, they've had their heart impacted by Christ in such a way that they're like, I'm in. I'm in. Which I think is cool. I don't know how you could see that and not be, yep, sign me up. Sign me up. So just as we, as we go forward here and... I, I know that was heavy, and, and I think that we should experience the heaviness of, of that because this is how much God loves us. This is crazy to me. This is how much the Lord loves you. This is how much the Lord loves me. This is how much the Lord loves little baby Bodhi back there, that he was willing innocently, you know, this innocent man to experience these things. And in the Gospel of Luke, the main thing that stood out to me was Jesus' response to God in regards to the people that were doing this to him. I think that as we read through this, all of us can be a little upset, right? So number one, there's a couple things that I think we want to remember, is that Jesus foreshadowed this and prophesied this all along. It's been prophesied even in the Old Testament. So these things have, were always meant to happen. It doesn't mean that the people who are involved get a pass. Like, I, I, don't think it, I don't think it works that way, but this was part of the plan. So there is comfort in that. Remember as Jesus prayed and he said, God, if this cup could pass from me, that'd be swell, but your will be done, right? So he, he knows that there is a great, there's a great hope beyond this. So even though it's heavy, there's a purpose and there's a reason and it's not something that surprised Jesus and it's not something that surprised the Lord, right? But what I really love in, amongst all of that is Jesus' ability to recognize the blindness of, of the people who are hurting him. I thought that was pretty amazing because when you think about it and Jesus says, he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. I think that if it was your eye on the cross, we would be like pretty convinced that they knew what they were doing. 
right? If you're being stoned, like, you know, the Bible talks about Stephen, you know, being stoned, and he had a similar response, and somebody pointed out that that was the only other response like that of somebody telling the Lord, like, hey, they don't know what they're doing. That's incredible to me, because how could you be, like, being hit by rocks by people and somehow come to the conclusion that they didn't know what they were doing, right? That, that to me, is, is, is pretty incredible, and I, I, I think what Jesus is talking about, obviously they know they're crucifying somebody, but they don't realize, they don't recognize who he is. They're not seeing who he is in their anger towards him, right? There's a lot of anger, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. There's all this like turmoil in their hearts and Jesus is recognizing that I bet if they really knew the truth, they would have a change of heart. That's, that's what I would propose. And it just kind of struck me because I think that today we have an opportunity to respond in the same way to people who seem to be trying to crucify us. And, and none of us, you know, are, are experiencing persecution. I would, I'm just going to go out on a limb. I don't know. I don't live your personal life. But if you live in Bend, Oregon, you're probably not at risk of actually being crucified. Thank you, Jesus. Yep. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. <laughs> but yet there are stuff going on in our, the culture of our country and of our, you know, our state or our city that we might disagree with and that we might also view as very anti-Christ. And that's really what's, what's happening here is there's this anti-Christ agenda we want to get rid of Jesus. And I think that today, many of us, unless we don't watch the news or don't go outside, can recognize the similar things happening in culture today. Would you agree? Yeah. Maybe something. I don't know. Maybe it's one thing that you recognize. You say, yeah, you know, they really want to keep Jesus out of the school. Man, that, that feels a little anti-Jesus. Or they really want to keep, you know, Jesus kind of out of, you know, like politics or anything. It feels a little anti-Jesus. And those things have the, the tendency of, make, if you're a Christian, making you pretty upset. How many of you guys have felt pretty upset over stuff like that? Okay. How many of you guys have felt like almost even like just like hatred for a group of people that subscribe to certain ideals? And, and if you're just really honest, sometimes you feel like the world would be better if they're just gone. Anybody? All right. I'm just let's, We can be real here, okay? It's not like... Somebody's going to come back and be like, I can't believe that you're a human being and you have feelings that aren't always <laughs> pure. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, me too. <clears throat> me too. But I've been on a journey. You know, the Lord says to love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. The last, about maybe the last two years now, personally, I've been on a journey of trying to better live that out. To, to not be so offended, to not be so upset, to trust that the Lord can use even chaos for his purposes, right? Yeah. What we see is chaos. I mean, even in this time, you guys understand that the time that Jesus is living in here is, if, politically speaking, we're in a lot better uh, political climate than Jesus was in. Yeah. I mean, they're not even, they don't even rule their own country. Somebody else does. And they're not Christians, they're, you know, polytheists. They're, they believe all kinds of crazy things. And yet, I don't see Jesus stomping around too worried about it. I don't see him stomping around telling everybody to watch out for the next elected Caesar, which might have been Nero. I don't know. One of them was really bad. I mean, it, it, it got worse before it got better. And I just, I just want to challenge myself to, be, to make sure that I'm focused on kingdom and not the world, the, the things that I perceive that are not going the way that I want them to around me. And Jesus seemed to always be connecting himself with the heart of the Father for people. And it's also interesting that many of the Jewish people wanted a Messiah that was going to be a political leader. That's really what they were, you know, waiting for, 
is that somebody would come and take the country back and would sit on the throne of David and that they would have this great reign. Jesus didn't check any of those boxes in the way that they, they thought he would. Jesus obviously is sitting on a, a great throne and he is king, but it looks a little different than what the people wanted because the people were so focused on the earthly things that they were, they were blinded to, to a greater reality, a greater kingdom, a greater ruling, a greater connection. And I love that, that Jesus in this moment of these, this very system and these very people condemning him to death is asking God to, to have mercy on those who cannot see. That the Lord would recognize that they're just missing it. Now, obviously, hell is a real place. Judgment is real. And some people are going to go there. But I truly believe that it's the heart of the Father that people come to know him. I, I believe that God first chooses mercy and grace and then when all those things are, are spent and there's, there's just no change and no recognizing the love of the Father, that there's, there's eternal consequences for that. But I don't believe that God is like celebrating that because if God didn't care about an eternity apart from him, if he didn't care about us going to hell, he wouldn't have came and saved us. He doesn't want us to spend eternity away from him. He doesn't want these people to spend eternity not knowing him. And Jesus recognizes that. He sees beyond the offense. He sees beyond the differences. And he prays a genuine prayer for mercy for those that are putting him to death. To me, that's real heavy and real challenging. Because it's, that's a hard thing for me to connect with sometimes. I can look around and I can see all the stuff that is going wrong or, or, hey, sometimes it's just listening to the voices out there that are telling me everything's going wrong. Okay, so sometimes we gotta turn off the radio or change the channel because, you know, if, I, I wanna listen to the voice of the Father. I don't wanna be listening just to somebody who has you know, opinions about everything, and they're usually negative, okay? I want to, I want to, I don't want those things to shape my, the way that I, I view people, and I, I don't want to enter into a, a, a belief system that somehow says that God isn't big enough to cut through it all anyway. When, when, I, when I look at the story of Jesus in this moment, of forgive them, he realizes that even in the chaos, God is still in control. God is still on the throne. And he's not freaked out. <laughs> he's not panicking about, you know, what might happen to the school system or whatever. Now listen to what I'm, I'm not saying. I'm not saying not to care about those things. Because I think that we should care about those things, and I think that we should engage culture. I think that we should be the light and salt of the earth. I think that we should have things that we stand for in a moral ground and, you know, in, in, in a direction that we're heading. I just would hope that our reaction to those who seem to be anti-Jesus or anti-Christ would be to pray for them, to recognize that if they knew the truth, they might change their mind and to hope that God can encounter them in such a way that they see the light and that light changes their life forever. I'm gonna leave the judgment to the Lord. I'm gonna, I'm not even, come on man, I'm not even worthy, like I can't pass judgment. And who am I? Every, you know, they have a saying, they say every time you're pointing a finger, you got like four pointing back at you and a thumb if you, if you really can work it. <laughs> You now your thumb's pointing to the person next to you, so <laughs> might be something on that. I'm just saying, none of us are really all that good, you know. We're 
but I mean, maybe you are, but I just recognize within myself that, man, if it wasn't for like God's love, grace, and mercy in my life, man, there, there would be some, some bars set that I just, I couldn't, I couldn't live up to. And I am so thankful that the Father loves me and that Jesus intercedes for me in this way. That Jesus' heart for me is like, I know Nick just did A, B, and C. I, I know it looks, it looks bad, but trust me, he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't, he's not seeing clearly. I love that. And so my challenge for us today is, is, is just that if, if we need to, as we engage the world around us, Jesus needs to be our, our example. I, I just can't imagine a scenario that would somehow allow us to react differently to people than Jesus did. I, I can't imagine a reason that would be good enough to say, yeah, I know Jesus said that, and I know Jesus, and he's not just saying it, he's living it out, right? I know Jesus lived that way, but check this situation out, okay? If Jesus was in this scenario, he would, he'd get it. I just, I, I can't imagine that. He's being murdered. Murdered. You know how scary that would be? I mean, I'm just trying to think of for myself. I mean, that would... I don't know how I'd even have a clear enough mind to say a prayer like that, to request something like that to the Father. I don't want to just... I don't want to just do this. Like, I don't want to just say, like, yeah, I love people. Be for the sake of saying it. I need to know for myself that that love is real. I need to know for myself that that love, ha- it, it, it's found a place to land in my heart and it's not just lip service. It's not just how we say, God to love them or God bless them or, you know, no, but I truly do have a heart for people the way that Jesus did. I gotta know that for me. And I got to start challenging myself when there's stuff in my heart that doesn't match. I got to challenge myself not to enter into conversations anymore that promote an unloving response to people. Now, again, love isn't that thing where you just pat everybody on the back and tell them they're doing a good job when they're doing something terrible, okay? So, you know, you need to make sure your definition of love is biblical and it, it matches, you know, the kind of love that a good parent gives to a child. But if there's anger and fear and, and hatred and all that stuff, and usually that stuff starts with fear, we want to bring that to God. I want to keep coming back to the Lord. And I want to repent. I mean, I want to tell God, I am sorry that I am not loving the way that you loved me, the way that you love that person that I have this feeling for. I want to give that to you right now, Lord. I want to release it. I want to forgive that person. Forgiveness is real powerful, really powerful stuff. And we need to be willing to forgive the people out there, maybe you don't even know them, but you just feel angry. Maybe that's today. There's somebody, there's things happening. You're just angry towards a group of people. That today can be the day that you can go to the Father and say, you know what? I forgive those people. They don't know what they're doing. I'm going to pray for them. God, open up their eyes. You love them. You love them like you love me. I think that response is amazing. And, and I think that if we can start there, then that gives us the right and and the access to engage culture. Because there's a lot of Christians that haven't started there and they've engaged culture and they've gave the church a really bad name. Because they try to engage culture from a place of fear, anxiety, and, and honestly, some hate. And people are like, man, you Christians are, you guys, you guys are a mess. I think if we really want to engage culture, we need to first make peace with culture. That doesn't mean that we agree with it. That doesn't mean that we're for it and supporting all the, the stuff. It just means that we have we've offered, we've forgiven 
those that do not know what they're doing. And in love, we engage culture. And we show up because why? Because we want to help people see. We want to help people see. We don't want to make them just feel bad. We want to show up and show them a better way, right? Not everybody's going to listen. Not everybody's going to respond. Not everybody's going to choose Jesus. Okay, that's between them and God. And, but, but I'm not the guy who's going to condemn, right? I'm going to show up in love with truth, but I don't want to show up in a, out of a place of anger or fear. So I'm going to land this plane right there, and I hope that was a good challenge to all of us. I think it's a good challenge to me. I want to show the world out there what it looks like to really be a follower of Jesus. Yeah, we have some non-negotiables, but we also truly love people. We truly want the best for people, and we know the best for people is Jesus, right? Amen? The last thing I want to share, Dad's going to come up here, Pastor Ron. I call him Dad. You guys call him Captain Ron, Pastor Ron, Mr. Ron, whatever you want to call him. He's going to be up here. Within reason. Within reason. But as, I'll, I'll let you know if, if it's okay or not. So you ask me, not him. Um, you might come up with something good. I <laughs> he might not see like how clever it is, and I, I might see that. So today I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to be up here for prayer, but I'm only praying for people that need physical healing. So there are other people up here that will pray for that too, but for me personally, I was in the car yesterday, and I was complaining to the Lord about not seeing enough miracles. And I, the Lord instantly put this thought in my mind, like, why don't you start praying for people for miracles? <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah, I could do a better job at that. So from now on, every Saturday, I'm going to be up here with the prayer team, but I'm just praying for physical healing for a season. So if you want prayer for anything else, um, there's a lot of people. I just, I feel the Lord has put this on my heart to do this. So without further ado, Captain Ron. Wow, I love physical healing. I've seen <laughs> thousands and thousands of people healed. So it's a good thing. Um, yeah, you know, I was just praying and, and the Lord led me to Ezekiel 37. And it's, you know, Ezekiel is this mighty prophet of God. And, and it says that the Lord took him by the spirit to a valley of dry bones. So here this guy is transported in the spirit to this valley of dry bones and the Lord asked him a question. And, and actually it says these bones were very dry. So these weren't bones that somebody died yesterday. They died a long time ago. Then the Lord asked him a question, can these bones live? And you know, here, here we got the prophet, the man of great faith. And we would expect him to say, well, of course I can, because you're God. He doesn't say that. He says, only you know. He was being honest, right? And God never does tell him these bones can live. He just says a simple thing to him, prophesy to the bones. <laughs> and it says that Ezekiel prophesied life to the bones and all of a sudden there's this rattling sound as the bones begin to come together. Can you imagine? And then the Lord said to him, prophesy to the breath. And he prophesied that the breath would enter the bones and a great army came to life. This is one of the most incredible stories ever. And it's true. And I felt like this morning that there's some here that you've had something that feels a little bit like the dry bones. Something in you you've been dealing with physically for a long time. And it's like those dry bones. And the Lord says, do you believe that that place in your life can be healed today? And you're honest. Only you know, Lord. Only you know. And I feel like the Lord wants me to prophesy. And then you can come up for prayer. But I'm going to prophesy. 
over your bodies. And I prophesy to your bodies and I say to that place in your bodies where it has not been right, I prophesy healing and health and wholeness today in Jesus' name. Even if you don't have the faith, just take a step at the end here and come up for prayer. Even if you're like, I don't know, Lord. I don't know, Lord. See, I believe Ezekiel, when he prophesied, he wasn't, still wasn't sure. He prophesied out of obedience. And that place where he obeyed, the Lord brought life. So I just declare over your bodies that there will be life brought forth today in those places that have felt dead. Because God is here today to bring life.